I, yeah, I, I did. I had the honor of kicking it off in, was it 19? Miami. And then the world went to shit. It was October, man, but what an honor to be back. Uh, the faces look a little older than they did in October of 19. I think a lot of you guys got exemptions to get in here. So when I saw a lot of you last night, I went back to my presentation. I increased the font size because I was like, I don't know if these people are going to be able to see this stuff. But um, really appreciate the first presentation. I uh, learned a lot. A lot of really great tactical stuff. Um, so for me, it's an unbelievable honor to be up here because if you really think about it, if you're sitting in this room, you survived. You survived personally, professionally. Uh, you protected your business. I mean, if you really think about the shit show that we just went through, and I guess we're kind of still in it, um, we didn't really know if we'd even be standing here today. And so I think it's, 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 a, it's an awesome opportunity to have a, a heart check, a gut check on just the fact that you got to be in this room, your businesses are still around, we're all employed, it's blessing. And so the person, I just wanted to congratulate you guys on the perseverance to get through that. I remember I called every mentor in my life when COVID hit. I called uh, Chris Tonko, he's the chief, op chief operating officer of 7-Eleven. I called Ken May from FedEx. Uh, he was also with Topgolf. I mean, I called everybody. Roland Hansen from Microsoft. I was like, what's the playbook? And all they could tell me was get liquid, have a ton of cash, and, uh, and just weather the storm. And um, so what they did say is there's always a first. There, there was a first time planes hit a building. There was a first time the mortgage industry crashed. They said, this is just another first. So what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is the journey that I've been on um, and in hopes that maybe it can help you with yours. And I just, I love franchising. I, we were, I was talking to some people earlier today. I feel like this group is, is like a, a very, a family to me. I remember I was talking uh, to the Fishmans and I said, I remember seeing your booth at IFA like 2018. And I was like, I couldn't even afford to work with you guys. And I was like, man, I hope I get to work with them someday. We were talking last night, right? And so I don't take it for granted, the path that, that we've been on. It's a testament to my team. Um, so anyways, and thank you guys for having me. Uh, for those of you that don't know what we're up to, um, I'm the founder and CEO of Unleash Brands. Uh, I started with Urban Air in 2011. Unleash Brands is the first youth enrichment platform that's ever been created. Um, I'll go through a little bit of the story around how we got there, but as we sit today, we have 1,300 franchises, 25 million guests coming through the doors on an annual basis, and just around or a little over 800 million in system-wide revenue um, across these four brands. So it's, we're on quite a tear. It's, it's been a ton of fun. Here's what I love talking about. I'm sure many of you, I ripped this off the internet, so I'm not taking credit for it. A lot of people, when you look at me, or you look at the guys from Horsepower, or people look at you in your life, they see that, all the accolades. And I think that's all cool. Um, but what I like to talk about with people is what's underneath. Like all this shit that we have to go through to be, even be sitting in this room today. And for me, all of these emotions I typically experience on a weekly basis, maybe daily. I think that I, I experienced a lot of this during COVID on a daily basis, sleepless nights, uh, wondering how I'm gonna make payroll. Um, I mean, you know, for us, we're brick and mortar. Uh, all of our businesses, and so you know, we had like millions and millions of dollars of lease obligations, right? I mean, there's many of you out there going through the same stuff. I had the opportunity to spend some time with John Maxwell last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, and um, he told me there are no, there, there, there's no two good days in a leader's life. That was pretty profound, right? He also told me, he's like, shit happens in threes. He didn't say shit, he's much more professional than me. Um, and if you think about it, it's so true. So with my team, I always say, look, when one thing happens, get ready for the next thing. And then when that thing happens, get ready for the third thing. If you think about a boxing match, you very rarely get KO'd. Like we all want the KO in UFC, we all want the KO in boxing, but it's typically the combination that knocks someone down. And it's the same in business. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is how we've addressed these things, how we fought through these things and got to the other side. As I mentioned, I started Urban Air in 2011. Um, it was just a dream. A dream for me to create a place where kids could celebrate, escape, connect, get off a screen, like unplug. 
We opened one location in South Lake, Texas. We hired oh, 50 some odd staff. We were just a trampoline park at the time. Quite frankly, I only got to go in this building because my dad knew the guy. I, uh, otherwise, everybody was laughing me out of town. Banks were laughing me out of town. Landlords were laughing me out of town. Like the whole thing was just like, what? This is insane. There is no way you're going to put a bunch of trampolines in a warehouse and this is going to work. But we did. We spent a year building the concept. Uh, we opened in South Lake, Texas in this grungy old warehouse, just trampolines. We hired 50 kids, 50 high school kids. And we told them, we were like, we don't know what we're doing, but what we can guarantee is that we're going to have a ton of fun and we're going to learn all along the way. So I personally, probably many of you in here who have started companies, I worked every position. The register, I was a janitor, I host parties, I did everything. I was closing at 1 a.m. only to get back up there at like 8 a.m. to turn the HVAC on because we couldn't allow it to run all night. We couldn't afford it in a 25,000, 30,000 square foot space that we needed mom to be comfortable in in the morning. I slept in the foam pit many times. But what, what I learned along the way was how to lead kids, how to lead people, and how to love on the guest and provide an exceptional guest experience. I've always been a huge nerd, um, and so I'm a big data guy. When I was in college, I started a data company out of my dorm room, and I sold it to Roland Hansen from Microsoft, who was the chief marketing uh, officer for Microsoft globally. He came up with the Microsoft Windows brand. It's an awesome biography to read. He's still a friend of mine. He lives in Santa Barbara now. And so I'm a huge nerd, and so I was always studying the law of diffusion of innovation, going, man, I think I'm onto something. How do I make this work? Too many times, and I, I, would, I would caution you, I would challenge you, too many times people try to be everything to everyone. And or they develop this product forever in a little vacuum, and then when it's released, you're like, oh man, that was a huge miss. And so I created this framework on the backside of the law of diffusion of, uh, of innovation, and it was really simple. It was understand your customer, know why they visit or buy your product, use, use speed and information to create an MVP, minimum viable product. I think. The horsepower guys were talking a little bit about this. An MVP is something just good enough to launch, and then you put it on a continuous feedback loop, right? So mom was always our feedback loop. And we even do that today when we launch a new product, a new menu item, a new technology. We're always using an MVP. And we're focusing on that first 16% on this bell curve, the innovators and the early adopters. And we're getting all their feedback. And we know that when we per per perfect it for them, that they will bring in the herd. And then the laggards, for example, you're never gonna get them, so we don't really focus on them all that much. Um, we spend all our time and all our energy on understanding that customer. And then we wanna constantly innovate. These guys were talking about it earlier. We, we do the same thing. We're always innovating. Like I always say, I wanna be on the leading edge of whatever it is I'm doing, not the bleeding edge. Bleeding cash, bleeding all my stuff. It, it's time, resources, people. So we're always, innovating. And I want to talk to you about innovation because when we moved into our garage, we were having some success with this framework and we opened two additional locations. In this garage, what we learned was we couldn't be in three places at once. Each one of the dots on that map were about an hour from each other. So when something happened, there was absolutely no way for me to get there. The Wi-Fi goes down, like somebody rips a urinal off the wall. All of these things have happened. Somebody brought in a kangaroo and was claiming that it was a uh, anxiety pet. <laughs> Unbelievable stuff that we have to deal with. I'm not joking, these are all true stories. I'm gonna write a book someday about all of the crazy stuff we've dealt with. Just this last year, we had the largest coordinated bomb threat in US history. Thank God it didn't happen. Yeah, got a call to the call center. We've placed bombs in all of your locations. They're gonna go off on, was it Columbus Day? It was one of these days. Millions of kids are going to die. We're like, come on. Really? It was about a year ago coming up this February because it was my sister's birthday. I was at a hibachi place and like had to run out into the parking lot and get on a Zoom with the FBI. And he was, his title, best title ever, he was, he was a specialist of weapons of mass destruction. I was like, I love you. Like, what an awesome title. Anyways, I've been through it all. And what we learned in this garage was that we had to create systems. There was no bomb, by the 
There was no bomb. It was all good. We did bomb. We did a national coordinated bomb sweep all on a Friday night while guests were in the park. Secretly. Secretly. It was wild. So we created systems and processes and procedures. And we were doing this selfishly because these were just family owned stores. We weren't even franchising. I didn't even know what franchising was. I watched that McDonald's movie. That's about the extent of my franchising experience. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And so we created all of the infrastructure, the systems, the procedures, the tech, everything that we needed for our own stores. And we didn't even know that that would be the foundation for franchising when the first person called from Wichita, Kansas and said, will you franchise this business? And for me, where I'm getting a ton of phone calls, I always dive into that and go, man, I'm getting enough interest here. Like Maybe I should look into that. And that's actually how we got into franchising. Um, so we started crushing it. We were doubling the size of our company every year. In 2019, we deployed over $180 million of franchisee capital and opened 52 locations in 52 weeks. It was insane. But what I learned is, and I'm sure you see it too, where there are profits, there will be great competition. And so I started having to look at my business and go, man, if I don't do something, this trampoline park is just going to be a race to the bottom on price. That's all we could compete on. And so I started to think about it. I started to study the theme park industry. I had just moved into a neighborhood, and I went to a neighborhood barbecue, and I sat next to this guy. And, he, and I was like, hey, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm actually the, an executive at Six Flags. And I was like, oh, tell me more. And I started having him mentor me. Now he's my, the CEO of Urban Air. Um, but he was opening parks all around the world. He was telling me, he goes, Michael, did you know Six Flags is really in the food and beverage business? We just give people something to do between eating and drinking. I was like, the light bulb went off when you think of the world that way. So I started ripping out trampolines. I started inventing attractions. I built a fast casual restaurant inside the, inside the park. I, I stopped selling time and sold one price at the front, hoping that I could increase the length of stay of the guest so they too would buy food and beverage. And so what we did is in 2017, we launched the world's first adventure park. It was in Sugarland, Texas, and it was, it was revolutionary. It was awesome. And from that point forward, we continued to innovate. We now have indoor, indoor skydiving tunnels. Has, has anybody ever been to one of ours or iFly? Super, super fun. And we're one of the, the largest indoor karting operators. It is a wild, wild ride. We were having a ton of success, and it all had to do with innovation. See, my goal is always to create barriers to entry in your business. You want to put a moat around that castle. You want to protect it. You want to have a differentiated offering. And so one of the things I would challenge you to do, whether you're an emerging brand, a mature brand, is to look at your product and go, is my product complex enough to create barriers to entry, but simple enough for the guest to understand? It's really, really important. If you don't continually innovate, then somebody's going to come up behind you and kick your ass. I always kind of live in that, that slight era of paranoia where I'm always just wanting to get better. Because I know if I don't, somebody's going to come and take it. So I want to give you some examples today of innovation, some of my favorite um, successes and failures in innovation. So first one, let me, or let me introduce you to my nine pack. This is something that I created. And we run it through our filter at Unleash Brands. So you want to be in the top right. You want to have a unique product. And you want to have a unique business model. Think about it. You can't, have, you can't just have one. If you're only a business model innovator, then your product is really just a me too product. And it'll be too easy to copy. If you're only top left, you're going to be a product that's so expensive, you're not going to get mass distribution. And, and it, it won't work either. So you want to be in that top right. And it's really, really hard to do. Let's look at some examples. And the other thing is you've got to keep innovating, because if you don't, you can drop your position. Think about taxis, rental cars. They were, they own the world, right? I haven't rented a car until fr this Friday, where I had to drive from Orlando to here for some because I had some meetings in Orlando. I hadn't rented a car in over two years, not because I didn't travel. I'm executive platinum this year. I traveled, but what did I do? Uber and Lyft. So what happened is, is the taxi industry, rental cars got complacent. 
They sat there going, man, we own the world. Now all of a sudden, Uber and Lyft with tech and no inventory came and started to crush them. Really, really important. Another one, hotels. Look at Airbnb and, and Verbo. Do you guys really call it Verbo? Those commercials weird me out. Like I've been calling it VRBO for like 10 years. Okay, are you with me? And I'm the only one that hears that and I'm like, that just sounds weird. Nevertheless, they've taken a huge chunk out of the hotel industry. How many of you have stayed in a VRBO in the last 12 months or Airbnb? All of your hands, your wallets would have gone to hotels not too long ago. How many of you Ubered to get to the hotel from the airport? How many of you rented a car? That is game changer. And I don't think we really sit around and think about like what has happened. And when you really think about it, my parents always told me never to get in the car with a stranger. Now we're staying in their homes and we're getting in their cars. It's revolutionary. Another one of my favorite ones. Did anyone ever have an MP3 player that was not an Apple product? Okay, I did too. Some good hardware, right? But then what happened? It was hard as hell to get a song on those things. Apple came out with iTunes. You could rip those CDs on, very easy, and then you could start buying songs individually. Crushed the MP3 player. Who had a TiVo? I still have a lifetime subscription. If you know what I'm, you know what I, those of you that laugh know what I'm talking about because we still have it. It could hear the beeps of the commercials and help you skip them. It was truly the first DVR. But what happened was they didn't protect their tech. So all the cable companies ripped it off and put it in their own boxes. Last one, cable. I mean, there's some old people in the room and this is Young Conference. How many of you have, still have cable? Who has, don't raise your hand, don't lie. Who's raising, look at who's raising their hands. The rest of the world looks like this. They call it the Amazon effect, okay? Amazon psychologically reconditioned us to want to be able to get anything we want instantly and then damn near real time. In Dallas, I can order a tube of toothpaste from Amazon and it'll be at my door in three hours. There's no way they made money on that, but they do it, right? Why? That's the lost leader to, you know, get me on all the other stuff, right? Consumers want choice. Consumers want to, to watch what they want to watch when they watch. My kids think commercials are like revolutionary. They think live, they're like, Dad, is this live? When we're watching, I'm like, it's just bizarre. And, and it, we laugh, but we can be one of these stories, both good or bad. You can be a disruptor or you can be disrupted. And for me, when I moved from a trampoline park to an adventure park, I got banned from the International Association of Trampoline Parks. They banned me. Like, you're a quack. Now they changed the name to International Association of Adventure Parks. And they asked me to be on it, and I flipped on the bird. <laughs> but you can either be disrupted or you can be a disruptor. It's very simple. You've got to look at your business all the time. So we were on a tear with this innovation. I mean, an absolute tear. 2020 was going to be even better than 2019. We had it on the board to open how many in 2020? Six, 60 something. We opened 52 in 19. We we're going to open uh, 60 something in 20. And then COVID hit. March 17th was the scariest day of my life. I shut down every urban air location in conjunction with Chuck E. Cheese and main event. We literally just like went Ghostbusters on the entire industry. Just turned it off. I went from having a ton of revenue to nothing and $15 million in payroll. Scary. We didn't know if we were going to reopen. We didn't know if, when, if we reopened, if people would come back. It was absolutely wild. All I told my staff was I said, I'm calling everyone under the sun to get some mentorship here. I don't know what I don't know. We're going to make decisions in real time. I'll probably contradict myself tomorrow based on what I told you yesterday, but we're just going to roll. I said, we didn't come this far to come this far. I said, 
we're going to get through this. And I said, we got to keep our heads up, our eyes open, because where there is turmoil, there will be opportunity. And, and I said, you're just going to have to follow me. I said, we're going to try to spread the pain across everyone so that no one individual vendor, franchisee, employee bore the brunt of it. So yeah, we had layoffs, right? We tried to do a lot of different things to get through it, and we got through it. We're all sitting here today, but I told him, I said, crisis does two things. It presents opportunities to pivot and improve, and it separates the players from pretenders. The fact that you guys are sitting in this room shows that you're a player. In the FEC space, there were over 300 family entertainment center closures during COVID. We had zero. And it was a testament to Josh and the team. Josh single-handedly renegotiated all of our leases on behalf of franchisees. We got PPP for everyone. We got EIDL where needed, very similarly to what you did. But I told him we would do these two things. But I also said, there's a big difference between peacetime leadership and wartime leadership. If you haven't read the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, highly recommend it. So this is right out of that book. I said, look, in peacetime, we're trying to build consensus. We're growing market share. This is not peacetime. We are fending off an imminent existential threat that wants to kick our ass. And we have to change how we behave. And I think a lot of people tried to stay in, in peacetime leadership during COVID, stuck their head in the sand, and they got their asses handed to them. Where a lot of you are sitting in here today, and you just like, you just tied up your boots and you just got, you just went at it. Because that's all you knew how to do. So this is a great slide, I'm not gonna go through it. But what I told my team is we're gonna have to violate protocol to win. We are gonna have to care about the dust on a gnat's ass during this process. Every penny, I froze travel, I froze Amazon, I froze everything. And, and then I told him, I said, look, we're gonna let the war determine our culture. So we're gonna be paranoid. And I said, now is not a time for consistent building. You're either on the bus or you're off the bus. And I think that, now we're back in peacetime, so I've, I'm, I'm moved over to the left side. But I think it's really important to understand where your business is. Not, it doesn't always have to be COVID that can put you, put you into war. It could be a competitor who's knocking off your product, somebody stealing your IP. You could have an internal culture war. There's a lot of reasons on why you had to get onto the right side of the page. You can't live there, though, because you grind everyone to the ground. But this is a great book. Would highly recommend it. So what we did is we looked internally, and we said, Let's, let's start to look at that speck of dust on a gnat's ass in every area of our business. My chief marketing officer, Jessica Correa, told me, hey look, when we come out of COVID, we need to give moms a fresh new look. So let's rebrand Urban Air. I was like, well, what's that gonna cost me? She's like, I don't know, a couple million bucks. And I was like, oh, this is COVID. And then she said, hey, oh, by the way, your franchisees are broke, they have no money for marketing. How are we gonna relaunch? Essentially, we had to re-grand open an entire company. At that time, it was 152 locations. We had to re-grand open 152 locations and everybody was broke. So I said, well, I mean, I went to my board and said, hey, I mean, really guys, there's no difference between being broke and really broke. So like, let's just go all in on this thing. And we loaned our franchisees the money they needed to come out of COVID from a mark for marketing for the first 60 days. And we built a marketing platform very similar to, to what you guys did. So I know how hard that is and it's impressive. We also implemented a new labor optimization system because Chris Tonko was telling me that the gig culture was really gonna change how people interact uh, and where they wanna work. He also told me that people are, they were seeing at 7-Eleven, right, his sample size was much larger than me, that people were not gonna want, or not wanting to come back into the stores and deal with everyday people. And he said, hey, I think the fact that you're dealing with 1,500 to 2,000 people at a time, you're gonna have people go, I don't wanna, I don't wanna work in crowds. So we created this labor optimization system that reduced payroll in the parks by 46% while still allowing us to operate and maintain an NPS score over 50. But it was during this entire time that I looked at the business and I was like, man, I think my team is meant for more. I think this, plat this is a platform we build is meant for more. And I said, there's so many businesses out there that could plug into this. 
how would we do that? What could we do? Who would we service? And so I started to think about, I went back to what Roland Hansen taught me about, you can't be everything to everyone. And in the platform space, we're like, okay, so maybe we, we focus on entertainment brands. I was like, well, that, that total adjustable market is too small. Maybe we focus on brands serving women. I was like, oh, that total addressable market is too large. But what are we gonna do? And so I started going back to my roots and looking at the data. You see, over 25 million kids come into urban air on an annual basis. And the average basket size is 2.23. So on average, a mom comes in a Honda Odyssey minivan and she brings 2.23 kids and she pays 20 bucks per kid, and then she pays $5.63 for each kid when they're in there for food and beverage. Okay? Knowing all your per caps allows you to make these types of changes. And I said, okay, let's look at this. See, each one of these guests is profiled. If you're not profiling your guests and understanding your customer, you're gonna get watered down. So of the 25 million kids that come, on, come in on an annual basis, there's eight lifestyle segments that are driving the success. It's that old 80-20 rule, okay? 80% 80 of our revenue is coming from eight lifestyle segments out of 66, all right? Of that, 50% of our revenue is coming from four groups, four groups, with group 18, kids in cul-de-sacs, being the number one group. And this is, this is funny, okay? Honda Odyssey minivan, shops at Target, like that's our mom. We use this for marketing. Josh and his team use this for real estate selection. Um, it's unbelievable. So I went back to my roots and I said, who are we really serving? We've perfected serving mom. Mom is our customer and kid is our user. And we've gotten really, really good at that. So at that same time though, as a parent, I have three kids, a, a 10, seven, and two. It, and we're from Texas, the promised land. And if you, we, we got out a little earlier than a lot of you guys, okay? And so I started Googling, like, where am I gonna put the kids? It was literally like a restart, right? And so I'm like Googling, like, man, where am I gonna put these kids? I got a 10-year-old who likes theater and arts. I got a seven-year-old who like needs discipline. Then I have a two-year-old. I was like, I don't, I don't even know how to do the baby thing anymore, right? So I'm Googling and I realized the opportunity was that the market was fragmented. Very similar to what Horsepower is doing, Fragmented market. There was consolidation opportunity there. I was like, man, what are some other comps? Like neighborly. Nobody had taken the kid space and organized it like neighborly or driven. And, and, and so I go, but we have an opportunity here. No offense to neighborly or driven people in the room, but like people really don't want to have to do business with these guys because that means shit went wrong with either their house or their car. Okay? My, my wife was telling me that, that she was getting the windows cleaned and I was like, oh man, right? Like, oh. so, but they have done a phenomenal job making it so easy on the consumer to go find what you need and get it taken care of. But nobody's done it with the most important asset in a family, the kids. It was baffling to me. Yeah, there's Angie's List and, there are, and there's like good housekeeping seal of approval stuff like that, websites, referral websites but nobody had created a platform that would partner with parents to help them Im improve their kids' lives, make them great. And I started going, what do kids need to do to become great kids? This became my thesis. Kids need to learn science, technology, reading, arts, and math. Kids need to be able to escape and go play in fun places where they can build courage they can celebrate special moments and they can connect socially offline. And then they need to be able to grow in their skills and hobbies. Sports, karate, swimming is an essential skill, things like that. When you really boil it down, that's what kids need. They need these three things. And so when I laid out the addressable market, my mission became to bring world-class brands together to acquire world-class brands and be able to Plug the kids in, those 25 million kids a year, plug them into this ecosystem. Get them in a small gym and let's teach them how to take instruction. Let's teach them how to socialize with others. And then once they've learned that, we can then push them into a swim school or full-scale gymnastics, put, the, put them in sports. We believe they can be great kids today. Our definition of great is not a select team athlete. It's not even a straight-A student. It's a kid 
that tries their best. It's a kid who respects authority. It's a kid who doesn't quit. It's, it's just, it's being a good kid. I keep telling people I'm on a mission. I'm like, if you're tired of yelling at your TV, if you're tired of not liking one political party over the other, if you're tired of bitching about vax or no vax, mask or no mask, then let's do something about it. We have the opportunity to impact the next generation. We don't have a laws problem in the United States. We have a values problem. And so what we're on a mission to do is instill amazing values on kids who are going to be the future leaders and hopefully solve all the crap that we're dealing with today. That's the, tr the impact that we're trying to make. So to do this, we kicked off Unleashed Brands on the back of the Urban Air platform. Last, it was June or July, we acquired Snapology. Then we acquired the Little Gym. And then most recently, last December, we acquired Premier Martial Arts. And so when you think about where we sit today, and we have more, more acquisitions we'll be announcing here soon, but when we, where we sit today, we've really got a great ecosystem going. And we love it. Kids are coming into the little gym at as young as four months. Then we can help them decide what kind. Do you want to go into coding? Do you want to go into martial arts? Oh, they all need birthday parties, right? All of our brands serve birthday parties, have one-time events, memberships. It's, it's a phenomenal thing that we're doing. And it's not just phenomenal for the customers. It's phenomenal for the franchisees. The Horsepower guys put a bunch of KPIs up there, which was awesome. I was taking pictures. Here's our franchisee flywheel. We measure success on the, on the metrics on the far right. We need to have profitable franchisees. We want brands inside of our family that achieve a 30% EBITDA or higher in a brick and mortar location. We like a 30% cash on cash return. We like growing brands. We like to be able to sell. This year, we're going to sell 275 franchises across our brands. We're going to open like 300 locations. We like growth. We like the generation of free cash flow. We like happy franchisees. We're shooting for FBRs of 75 this year, franchise business review surveys, all of those things. And the thing is, is when you get this flywheel moving and you get all of these brands working together, it is extremely, extremely powerful. So this year is going to be a big year. We're going to do some big things. Like I said, sell, sell 275, open 300, system-wide revenue over $800 million. We should bring in three to five acquisitions over this year um, to start continue to build out our ecosystem. So we're, we're really, really excited about what we're going. People always tell me, they're like, man, it seems pretty crazy. I said, yeah, I mean, I, I love to grind. I love what I'm doing. I said, and I would much rather set huge goals and not get there than achieve something small and be disappointed. It's just a much better way to live. And so I wanted to talk to you, or really challenge you. What are you doing that's crazy? If you're doing the same shit over and over and over again, that's the definition of insanity. Like, I'm always trying to keep my staff on the edge of the seat. Guys, we got to be trying something new. And in order to be as crazy as me, because people think they thought I was crazy back with Urban Air, and now they, they still think I'm crazy. So at this point, I just own it. it there's some things that you got to do. It's all about perspective, OK? So I wanted to, to end this talk. How much time do I got, Zach? 20-ish? 15? OK. Five quick things. Five. It's all about perspective. How many of you see a six? How, how many of you see a six? One guy. Few. OK, thank you. How many see a nine? And the rest of you are too old to see it. OK. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's all about perspective. If you change your perspective, you can change your life. We do things how we see things. We do things how we see things. Let's try another one. I'm coming to you and I'm saying, hey, I want to propose a business idea. Let's go into business together. We're going to sell shoes. How many of you would raise your hand and go, there's no market there? Raise your hand. It's no wrong answer. I got one. I got two. I got three. So how many of you would say there's a huge market there? There's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong answer. But some of you do not want to pursue this opportunity because how you think, what you see is changing if you raised your hand or not. I don't know. I mean, the optimist in me is like, would probably be like, 
man, there's a lot of shoes we could sell there. And then the other people will be like, but I don't know if they can afford shoes. Well, then can we invent a product that's affordable enough to sell into this market? I don't know. But it's all about perspective. So here's the five keys on perspective. You have to embrace hard. If there's nothing else that you leave with this week, I mean, I hope we get a lot more out of this conference than this, this, but you have to embrace hard. I didn't say endure. I said embrace. And the cool thing about embracing hard is that when you embrace it, it doesn't really become hard anymore. It's kind of a funny thing. Like, like I was talking about the one-two punch versus the combo. Like, I just expect that stuff. I expect that there's no two good days in my, in my life. I have a good one and then usually I have a bad one. We have a 24-hour rule at Unleashed. You can celebrate your wins for 24 hours or you can sulk in a failure for 24 hours. Either one, we're getting on with it after 24 hours. We're going to embrace it. Shortcuts don't pay off. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Your family, your business, your friendships, it's all uphill. The problem is we have uphill desires and goals and downhill habits. Think about it. Shortcuts don't pay off. Are you going to wing it? Or are you going to work for it? We like to grind. We like to hustle. John Maxwell told me, he said, Michael, honor is for what you've done in the past. If you want respect, you better do something today. Too many people want to live on those accolades, those trophies from the past, and the people are like, they're not doing anything. I love this. How many of you have watched the documentary where Saban and Belichick get together? Once a year, they get together, and they talk about the season and their coaching strategies and tactics. It's phenomenal. I literally got a notepad and was like taking notes. So this is from this, Cliff Notes. They said, both of them said, winners and losers have the same goals. It was, that was like very liberating for me. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Nobody shows up and goes, I want to lose today. The difference is that everybody wants to be number one, but not everybody wants to put in the work. Habits and your processes are what are going to separate you from being a winner and a loser. So you heard a lot of great stuff in the first talk about the infrastructure, the procedures, the systems. It's important. Not having the data that they have is like flying a plane with no cockpit. So important. Saban said the secret to all victory lies in the organization of the non-obvious. So true in franchising. And high achievers don't act like mediocres. We don't accept mediocrity at Unleashed. We want the best. We all make mistakes. That's fine. We can get on with it. But we absolutely do not accept mediocrity. So embrace hard. Number two, you have to get on a relentless pursuit of perfection to which you will never achieve. That's why we have the 24-hour rule. That was great. Now let's figure out a way to do it better. Fix it. Do it better. Improve it. We're in the business of great atmospheres, great memories for families, great environments for our teams, great businesses to be owners of and our franchisees to be owners of. Again, the definition of insanity is just going on that rat wheel over and over again and being like, man, I don't know why my KPIs aren't improving. What are you doing about it? Get on that relentless pursuit of perfection that you'll never achieve. Number three, this one was a big for me. Fall in love with the journey. We've all been successful, and it's very unfulfilling when you get what you think you wanted, and then you just like, well, I'm just going to set the bar higher. If you're on a journey and not a mountain, it's very different. And I tell my team, problems are just mile markers. Every competitor, everyone that wants to do what we're doing, everybody that wants to have success is going to have to cross these same mile markers. COVID was the ultimate mile marker. Could you, get, could you get to it? I mean, back in the old days before Waze, what did we do? We would call each other because we didn't have text. And we're like, what mile marker are you at? It's still there. They're still there. The difference is, is now just view them as problems. Guys, let's just get past it. Let's get better. Let's go faster. Let's come out of it on the other side. Others won't. That's why 300 closures in the FEC space, 300 companies did not make it past the mile marker of COVID. There, I don't remember how many uh, franchise closures there were. It was like tens of thousands of franchise businesses did not make it past mile marker 357 COVID. But you did. 
So you got to fall in love with this journey because once you get past a mile marker, there's just another one coming. There's just another one coming. We tend to overestimate the big moment and underestimate the, the value of small gains. So when they're doing P&L reviews, we, we do those things too with our franchisees. I go, guys, how can we improve every line on this P&L by just 1%? How can we get up every day and just improve a little bit? Because if we improve 1% every day at the end of the year, we could be 37 times better than we were. But so many times we want the like grand slam, the silver bullet. I mean, it's just really tough to live that way and always search for that. But if you have a great product and a great business model and you're, you're just improving it slightly over time, you can end up in an amazing destination. Let me give you an example. Have any, has anybody flown from LA to, to New York? Okay. Did you know that when the pilot took off, if he changed his heading just one degree over the course of that four hour flight, you would land in DC? It's the same in your life, with your habits, in your business. A slight change that you keep repeating over time and you stay that course can put you in a completely different place. Now, it could be bad or good, right? You could have some bad habits that put you in a wrong place. But we tend to overestimate the home run and underestimate how powerful the law of aggregations of small gains can be. You can't be afraid to fail. I love these two quotes. So Robert Schuler used to ask, what would you attempt to do if you knew you would not fail? I always ask my team when they have a problem, is it a money thing, people thing, a process thing, a system thing? Like, what do you need? Don't tell me you have a problem. Just tell me what you need, and it's my job to go get it for you. I would challenge you to ask yourself, your family, your employees, what would you do if you knew you wouldn't fail? What would you try? John Maxwell said, that's not really that realistic, though, Michael. So I would say, what would you attempt to do if you knew the failure of it would give you a positive return? Why? Because... You fail, you learn, you improve, and you re-enter. Then you fail, you learn, you improve, and you re-enter. Every time you re-enter, you're re-entering higher. It's really a revolutionary concept that's so empowering to your team. I always tell my team, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. We should be A-B testing all the time. And by, by just, it's a natural thing that in an A-B test, there's a winner and a loser. It was interesting, when you, when you read a, this book by Bob Iger, a former CEO of Disney, he came in with huge goals. He wanted to acquire Pixar, Lucasfilms, and Marvel. And everyone was like, no way. Steve Jobs thinks our, the, the prior CEO is an asshole. And you'll never find the Russian billionaire who owns Marvel. He'll never sell it to you. And Lucas, that's his legacy. There is no way you're going to get that from him. After reflecting of 20, 25 years of his life and being the CEO of Disney, he boiled it down to this. Long shots usually aren't as long as they seem. At Disney, our employees believe in their own power and in their ability to make things happen. That with enough energy and thoughtfulness, even the boldest ideas can be executed. Here's the thing, many of us quit before we even swing. We think the gap is bigger than it is. And our teams do that too. All they bring is problems and why you can't, why you can't. And I'm always like, can you find a reason why we can't? Okay? It is unbelievable when you change your perspective and you change your mindset and, and you put your people and yourself in a position where you're not afraid to fail. And finally, don't quit. There's this concept of the plateau of latent potential. A block of ice freezes at what, like... 32.1, right? But it's not that one-tenth of a degree that causes it to melt. It's the entire warming process that went before it. A stone cutter may cut a stone on the 101st swing, but it's not the 101st swing that caused the stone to crack. It's all the swings that went before it. Too many times we quit right on the edge of something amazing. And I know it's hard, but you gotta embrace hard. You gotta fall in love with the journey, you can't quit. 
because there's just amazing things out there for this group of people and for our teams and our customers. I mean, we can really change some lives in franchising. That's one of the things that I love so much and Josh and I talk about it all the time is the impact we can make on families. When franchisees come to me like, man, my wife got to buy that beach house that she's always wanted. We sent our kids to college. I got that, that boat. I'm like, well, make sure you have some liquidity left, you know? But, but really, you think about it, that's an amazing story, is that you're putting in people into business and giving them a tremendous amount of success. I've, I've lived my entire career being called crazy, right? And I, and I always tell people, like, landing on the moon was crazy until Neil Armstrong. 10,000 songs in your pocket was crazy before Steve Jobs. Self-driving cars were crazy before Elon Musk. And normal, everyday people going to space was crazy until Richard Branson, what, just a couple months ago. So if you're going through life and you feel like you're a square peg in a round hole, or people are calling you crazy, you got to embrace it. Uh, we, we really embrace that at Unleashed Brands. And so this is a video that I made for our founders. Watch this with me and then I'll close. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So look, most of us in this room, we started with humble beginnings. We worked our way up, we got here, we survived COVID, and there's just such a bright future ahead. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to hang out with you guys. We've got more momentum than ever. I know you guys are experiencing a lot of the same things. So my ask of you is to take as much as you can out of this conference, build, these, build back the relationships that we've only had over Zoom for the last, I don't know, 24, 36 months, whatever the hell it's been. And remember that when you're in the, that place where you're feeling crazy, don't quit. Embrace it because those who think they're crazy enough to change the world are the ones that actually do. Thanks.